Okay, good morning to everyone. Welcome to this very special lecture in English about uh, physics. Today we will discuss uh, a, a rather peculiar topic concerning the orbits of the planets. The point is uh, that uh, the, um, the usual uh, statement that explains how planets go around the sun which go under the name of Kepler's law, are very fundamental laws in the behavior of the planets, but we will now go to explore which are the limits of validity of these laws, something that is generally not done in any textbook, at least not in the high school. And uh, if you have any questions during the presentation, please raise up your hand and do and ask the question. Uh, this is a short outline of the content of the presentation, but I will quickly move to the first question I'm sure you already asked yourself. Why the title? What is Nalius in Verba? This is the motto of the Royal Society, a, uh, a club, a society made by uh, scholars in the 1666 in London, and it gathered some uh, very um, rich and noble person which has uh, possibility to uh, study and uh, analyze problems uh, and phenomena in nature and discussing among themselves and writing letters to other interest people to communicate to discuss some particular phenomena and talk. One of those <coughs> most famous members was Isaac Newton. And the words Nolius in Verba comes from a letter read, run, written by the late writer Horace to uh, <laughs> Mecenas. And he, the meaning of the words are, I have, I need no longer to trust uh, anyone on these very words. I should experiment and test and apply the, uh, the, the what you say in order to see what, if it is true or not. Uh, if you want, you can reinterpret this according to the popular wisdom and say that the proof is in the pudding. If you want to have a uh, check, you must to try and see what happens. And that this is what we are going to do today. Kepler laws were announced in different works from Kepler between 1609 and 1619 and uh, they concern how the uh, uh, which is the structure of the solar system how it is made up the sun sits at the center of the systems the system let me check and planets go around in uh, around the sun in orbits which are ellipses where the sun sits at one of the foci then the orbit is uh, is followed according to the second law. If you join by a line segment from the sun to the planet, it sweeps equal areas in equal intervals of time. Then the third law compares different orbits of different planets, saying that the far away the planet is, the slower it goes. And uh, numerically, the second, the second power of the orbital period is directly proportional to the cube of the extent of the orbit of the semi major axis. These were the milestones in research in astronomy, and they comes after a period of roughly 30 years of research made by Kepler, and they, they, they produced a dramatic change of, in point of view. The, the system before Kepler, Kepler and Copernicus uh, work was uh, geocentric. Now the human in humankind see that the Earth is not the center of the universe. These were laws were empirical, directly obtained by analyzing astronomical data. There was no interpretation beyond that. Why do they work? Were uh, the result achieved by Isaac Newton in the in this uh, work, Principia Mathematica Philosophiae Naturalis, 
where it states three laws concerning forces, how objects interact one another, and proposing a model, a theory, about how different masses attract each other, which is known as the universal law of gravitation. He interpreted the motion of the planets, basically noting that the force is central, is directed along the line joining the center of the objects. It is in inversely proportional to the square of the distance, uh, which can interpret the first and the third law. And here you have the first page of the first edition, 1687 uh, uh, of the Principia, with the correction made by Isaac Newton for the second edition. To read the uh, Newton work is not easy, and to have a demonstration of the first law in particular is very hard. There was a Nobel Prize, Richard Feynman, which was a teacher in Caltech Institute, that, uh, that uh, in his book, Feynman Last Lectures, says, I can't follow the Newton demonstration. And he invented another, he completed the demonstration showing that the uh, the, the laws actually do interpret the um, Kepler laws. It, the lecture was uh, done in uh, Caltech, 1964, March the 13th. This is the Italian version of the book. This is the original. This is the picture of Feynman explaining the lecture. By the way, that lecture was uh, done at the end of a period, and the first words of Richard was, don't worry, don't uh, enjoy the show because this, this lecture is done for the only sake of doing it, for the loving of explaining it to you. They would, there, there is no exam about that. And they were very happy. The key point is that the, in order to interpret and to prove the Kepler laws according to Newtonian uh, theory is to assume that the force acts by impulses. It is not constant. If you split the action of the force at several instants of time and uh, assuming that between an impulse and the other the force is zero, it is not impossible to prove that the orbit is actually an ellipse. So which is the framework we adopt to do that? We take the sun as the main object of the system sitting at the center of the coordinate system, the, here we have the Earth, and this arrow represents the force acting on Earth, and the component of the acceleration, a, a, AX and AY, are computed according to these relations, just projecting the vector along Y axis, axis and X axis. But in general, the uh, solar system is much richer than that, there are several objects and today we can do a slightly better. We don't need to assume that the force is zero between an instant and the other. We can assume that the force is constant. And if the force is constant, the acceleration is it as well. And in the case of a constant force acting on an object, we can easily derive the uh, relation explaining to us how the position changes with time and how the velocity changes with time. So that we can, can be found in the every physics textbook for, for beginners. If we have a constantly accelerated motion. It is not hard to uh, use this formula to work out the orbit of the Earth. You can do it by simply using a spreadsheet like Calc or uh, Excel in Microsoft Office and you take a tiny enough uh, interval of time and you can work out which is the path of the earth and you find it is an ellipse. Uh, we can do that here but I want to move to the main uh, part of the talk and the only point is that you, you we have no motion here. We, by using Excel or Calc you, you have straight for the orbit of the earth without seeing the earth moving and I think it is much more impressive if you see the earth that is moving in an animation. So I spend a little bit of time by writing a Java code which 
do this job for you. I uh, put in this simulation a simplified solar system with four objects. We have the sun sitting in the center, this yellow ball here, the Earth, Mars, and Jupiter. The, uh, the software computes the force acting on each object and uh, um, supposing that the force is constant for a very short interval of time, computes the new position occupied by the objects and it draws the image and then update it for the, in for the next frame. If the frames are close enough to one another, you have the impression of fluid and continuous motion, like you see when you go to the cinema. When you go to a movie, you see pictures one after another. And this is the exactly the same procedure which is used in numerical physics. When you want to simulate a system, you just do pictures, one very close to another, by studying the motion of the object you are interested in. <coughs> and this is what exactly this code uh, does. Uh, one important point, all the physics is, is contained within these lines. This is a Java code which translated in instruction which that can be, can be uh, comprehended and applied by the computer. A few lines computing the acceleration in uh, x chord, x direction and y direction. You see g, the mass of the objects, and the position divided by the third power of the distance. Now I, uh, let me, me put a pause to, this, to the um, presentation and we move to the simulation. This is it. By a double click in Windows, you can run the simulation. By a double click in Mac OS X, you can do the same. In Linux, it is slightly more complicated, but it, ca it can be done as well. Here we have a short presentation of the software, what, what you can do with this. And this will be available through the internet in the website of the school. Here we have the time elapsed by one frame to another, 0.5 means half a day. Time is in the units of days. FPS is frame per second, we can change this, say set to 40, which is, means that it will be a little bit quicker. So that 40 frames per second, half a day from one second to another, this means that in uh, simulation times, one second is equal to 20 days in the real world. Okay. Here we have a check on concerning energy. Then you set play. You see the, the body go around. This is the path of the Earth, Mars, and Jupiter. We can show the parameters of our objects. As far as let me the simulation. As far as the orbit is completed, you see that here mass has not yet completed its orbit. As, as soon as the orbit is completed, the parameter of the orbit are computed and shown by the software. Let, let us move a little bit by mass as well. You, you have parameters. The period for the Earth, it is computed 362 days instead of 365, but you can deal with this simulation. If, if you put there 0.1, which is two hours and a half, simulation goes much, much, much more precise. And the, the, the circles, the small circles you see here is the, what you would see if the orbit is exactly an ellipse. Mm -hmm. And you can see easily that there is an almost perfect overlap between the red line, for example, for Mars, and the ellipse, deduced by the orbital parameters. This confirms the first Kepler law. The orbit of the planets is an ellipse, and the sun rests on one of the four sides. Okay? And the same does hold for Jupiter, but it is much slower because it is more far away. 
while it is going on, we can check also the third Kepler's law concerning the relation between period and uh, extent of the orbit, just clicking the last <laughs> option in the, in the common yeah. panel. You see here the black line is the theoretical model, square of the period proportional to the third power of the major axis, semi-major axis of the orbit. You have already the data of the Earth and Mars. We are waiting for Jupiter to complete its orbit, and then we, we, we when we will the orbit is, is completed, it will go up there, more or less. But it is much slower. So this is made in order to check if the code works. Does it do a, do a good job? The answer is quite yes, because using those lines, those programming lines in Java, we are able to check and to obtain uh, straightforwardly the Kepler laws, that this implementation of the code is actually able to describe and reobtain the orbit of the planet. Uh, this can be done by a computer quite easily. For Newton, it was much harder because it had no computational tool. Apart from mathematics, he invented by his own in order to do that. Let me well, we can have a little bit more speed if we increase dt in order to see which can end more quickly. Here we have a counter showing seconds. We have total energy, kinetic energy, and potential energy. This is another check of the code. If the code works correctly, total energy must be conserved because gravitational force is conservative. So total energy shouldn't change. We can show a plot showing us the energy, which is here. Time, energy, red, uh, green line, total energy, red line, potential energy blue line kinetic energy. Okay. It doesn't much move much faster than what I thought. But I can show you this later. We can reset the system, so we return to the initial position, and that these data are in uh, er Earth mass, and the um, position and velocity are in gigameters per day, one billion meters every day. And this is Jupiter mass, uh, Mars mass, and the Earth mass, which is set to one. We can check still the second law, equal areas in equal time. We should play the simulation and see here that we have uh, time goes by. Delta T is the interval of time we allow the radial um, vector to sweep the area between a time interval from 0 to 40 days and to from 100 days to 140 days. Let me do this again. Let's restart it. Okay. You see. As the time sweeps the interval between 0 and 40, this counter goes on. As the time sweeps the interval from 100 to 140, this time goes on. And here we have a roughly acceptable agreement. If you have a more precise um, computation of the orbit, just shrinking a little bit the interval of time between one frame and the other, say 0.1, We, will, we should have a better agreement between the areas swept by the object. Okay. 
Any question? That goes on. That's it. This is the second significant figure is okay. So equal errors in equal time. Now the most interesting part comes in. Uh, I don't know if you already know that if you have a, uh, you take a textbook from astronomy, you uh, can easily find that a very high frequency of star system is a double star system. We have two stars orbiting one another. One point is, for example, to see what would happen if we lived in a double star system. If we have two suns, would we observe exactly the same Kepler laws? Would anything change? If we were in a triple star system, would Kepler living in that system find the same laws? Who knows? Nullius in verba, we should try it. We can change the mass of our object and see what happens. We know it works, so the answer is reliable. First, we change the Jupiter mass. Suppose we have another stars lighter than the sun, but orbiting in the same system. We change this number. And say, 10 to the 5. So this, in this case, we have Jupiter, which is one third of the sun. We have two stars in the same system. If you see, well, let me show you first this. <coughs> we can see where the center of the mass is. This green small circle shows you where is the center of the mass of the system. The main mass is in the sun. If I change the mass of Jupiter, which is right here, 100,000 times the Earth, you see that the center of mass moved away from the sun. The sun is no longer the center of the system. We have two objects, the sun in units of the star, um, uh, mass stars accounts for 300,000 uh, times the mass of the Earth. Now we have here an object which is 100,000 times the mass of the Earth. Let them evolve, a little bit quicker. and see what happens. Check. Energy is still constant, but quite different than before. Can you see any ellipse? No way. There are ellipses, in fact. But the ellipse is one followed by the Sun and Jupiter. They do ellipses, they follow ellipses around a common center, which is the center of mass. While the other two planets, Mars and the Earth, no longer fol follow any ellipse. Moreover, their path is no longer a, a closed curve they don't necessarily return where the, the, where in the point where they have left. And eventually some uh, catastrophic phenomena may occur, as you will, you will see in a few minutes. If I remove the path of the Earth and Mars and see only the path of the Sun and Jupiter, we see that they do follow ellipses. But they do, don't occupy any of the two foci because the focus now is the center of mass of the system, which in the former situation was occupied by the sun. 
why? Because the sun is the most massive object in the system. The, ma the su mass of the sun accounts for 99.86% of the total system. Only in that case, the Kepler laws do hold. If you don't have one major object in your system, you have no way to observe Kepler laws. There's nothing sitting at, the, at one focus of the system. Both do ellipses, <coughs> one orbiting around the center of the mass of the other. If you draw a segment from the Sun to Jupiter, then the only fixed point is the center of mass. What about a triple system? Now Jupiter and Mars are at both the mass of one-third the Sun. The only planet is the Earth. You can see this central mass is here. It does show the orbit of every object. Forty frame per second. Go on. Pay attention. <laughs> Have you seen this? The mass merge. It attracts and captures the Earth. After this event, the Earth no longer exists. It is part of the star which is here represented by Mars. This is a a nonsense track because uh, uh, a better code, maybe last year, next year I will uh, correct for that, should stop drawing the path of the orbit because it no longer exists. It, it lies within Mars, within the second star of the system. Now, nothing goes in ellipses. None of the stars are going to ellipse. I know another catastrophic event, two stars do merge. They form another object, but the code, as simple as it is, it can't follow this event. And in the plot of the energy, this behavior means the code breaks down. It do doesn't no longer do a correct job. Okay, but anyway, And if we have triple system with, with smaller masses, say a half of the previous case, five, 50,000 Earth masses, You see, in this situation, the Earth is quickly merged by the Sun. It falls into the Sun. Something else we can do is to realize that it is easy to see here. If you change only slightly the initial position of the objects, the subsequent evolution may differ a lot. Why? Because this system, gravitational system, are chaotic system. They don't behave regularly. There is no constant solution of the Newtonian equations. There are solutions which are periodic, which returns to the be beginning point at regular intervals of time, but they are not stable. Okay? Any questions on this? I can show you another code. 
which is, I'm not the author of this, but you can get it from the, to, from the internet. This is a three object system, every object at the same mass, and they evolve under the action of the gravitational force and they build a very nice picture which is constant, which is a regular path. But if you change a little bit the position of one of them, you break this constant, constant configuration. The situation is no longer stable. Okay? Or we can have another example with, say, four objects. Another nice picture. But if you're going to do, if I don't do anything, the round of error, which is quite <coughs> small, as you can see here, one part in 10 uh, billions, if you wait long enough, mm. it breaks because tiny, very small change in the initial configuration may allow for huge difference in time. So the system is not, uh, is not a regular behavior, apart from some particular configuration. And the Kepler laws do hold only in the case that we have a system similar to the sun. Let's get back to the presentation. We have already seen this, uh, this as well. We better move to uh, So which are the limits of the Kepler that we, we have searched for? Kepler's do hold if you have a system similar <coughs> to ours where the mass of the main central objects amounts for, accounts for almost the entire mass of the system, 99.85%. If you have two or many body problem, then you have no analytical solution. You can't work out the orbit of a triple system. There's no way to do that. In the uh, first year of the last century, the king uh, from no mm, Norway set out a uh, money prize to aware anybody who will be able to prove, to work out, which is the solution of the equation of motion for three, two, three, four, and many system. The prize was won by Henri Poincaré, a French mathematician, which shows that there is no solution. The solution does not exist and he won the prize. What about outside the solar system? Well, if you have uh, instruments powerful enough, we can study the main, the central part of our galaxy and follow the path of several stars and we see they do follow object, uh, orbital orbits which are ellipses. But this is due to the fact that the very center of the galaxy is occupied by a very dense and compact object, which is eventually can be a black hole. The mass of this object is roughly 4.3 million times the mass of our sun, and it is confined within a space which is roughly the same extent of the solar system, 40 astronomical units, more or less. You see we have a nice ellipse, and this, these objects are orbiting around in this path are stars. Okay. Moreover, you can study the uh, dynamics of spiral galaxies and compare the prediction of the Newtonian theory, in particular the third Kepler laws, and what you get is <coughs> that the spiral galaxy rotates but at a speed much higher than what it expected by counting the mass that you see. This is the physics below the claim that there exists dark matter. 
the universe is made 95% of something we do not have any idea what, of what it is made of. We only see its gravitational effects. It makes galaxies rotate much faster than what expected, and there is no other explanation apart from dark matter. This is one of the deepest mysteries in modern science. What is dark matter? Maybe Higgs boson will cast light on this, on this problem. Is it definitely true that every planet in the, uh, in the solar system follow the elliptical orbits? The answer is okay. Pardon. Uh, the answer is no. In 1959, in 1859, a French astronomer, Urbain Le Verrier, has shown, has shown that the path of Mercury is not an ellipse. It is an ellipse, but the major axis does rotate. So there is the precession of the ellipse. This phenomena can't be explained by Newtonian theory. It requires a deeper theory, which is provided by Albert Einstein in 1916, uh, and it is called General Theory of Relativity. Where gravity is very strong, Newtonian mechanics breaks down. It does no longer hold. It requires a deeper, a more precise, and more sophisticated model. There are other systems that behave similarly to our solar system, which is the, the atoms. If you take different electrical charges, they do attract or repel each other according to a law which is very similar to the law of general gravitation. But does, the, does this imply that there are similar law, Kepler's law for the atom? Well, let's move to another simulation and see what happens. Uh, here it is. I took this from the internet and modified it according to my need. You have the nucleus of the hydrogen atom, one electron, and let it move around. It will follow a nice ellipse, and the energy is conserved, and as far as the, the uh, orbit is completed, you can see the period of the orbit, and the, the areas are swept in equal amounts in equal intervals of time. So the first and the second Kepler laws do hold, even within an atom. But if we want to check for the third Kepler's law, we must move to a more complex system, which is, for example, helium. <coughs> it has two electrons orbiting around it. And uh, if uh, the Kepler laws will, would, uh, would apply, we will see both electrons, this is one, this is another, orbit around in ellipses. But in this case, the force between the electrons is, repul is repulsive. They repel each other, they push one away from another, and this changes the, the, the evolution of the, sy the system in a dramatic way, as you can see. The first electron does, doesn't follow a path, which is an ellipse, and the second has nothing to do with any orbit or the ellipse. So the similarity within with the uh, planetary mo model stops at the atom of at the simplest atom, which is the atom of hydrogen. Helium can't in any way be explained by a uh, classical model, by a uh, planetary model. In order to explain the behavior of the atomic system, you need still another part of physics. You must reinterpret time, space, motion, position, and move to quantum mechanics. Can I stop this? Nice game, isn't it? Okay, well, uh, well, I've already seen this. Uh, 
here we are. After having seen those simulations I made with all the bells and whistles that, that were needed, we can see that the planetary motion was well explained by Kepler's laws leading to the uh, interpretation of the laws uh, founded by the work of Newton and uh, uh, based on the gravitational uh, uh, universal uh, laws of gravitation. But the Kepler's laws are a very particular case. They do not hold if the system is double or if the, uh, the largest part of the system is concentrated in one object. The limits of the laws are also uh, shown up by the path of Mercury, which requires a more sophisticated theoretical approach to the problem, which is general relativity. And outside the solar system, the Newton gravitation works, which is what allows us to say that the center of the galaxy is occupied by probably a black hole, and that the what we see is not what there exists, because there is a large fraction of the universe universe which is made of dark matter, matter which does not emit light, light in any form. And uh, the similarity between electrical force and gravitational force stops to a very high level because you, you have no way to interpret complex uh, atoms by using the similarity with gravitational acceleration uh, force. Now there's room for questions and discussion. Thank you very much for your attention. I enjoyed very much preparing this lecture. Thank you. Thank you. The simulation I've done, the simplified solar system, will be available for a free download from the, uh, the website of the school. And the other I used, I will give the link. No question? No, I, so I stopped the recording. And if you are shy, if you are too much shy, you can ask questions with, with, with it, without that the world will listen what you say. <laughs>